Hello, everybody. Going to give it a minute. Hello, Peaches and Sugar from Nova Scotia. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming. Yeah, here it's uh, about 17 degrees, raining. But man, it's, uh, it's green. It's greener than it's been in quite a few years. So it's really, really nice. There's there's bushes out there flowering that I have never seen flower before. So it is it is quite lovely. All right, it's 7 o'clock. We have a big show. So welcome, everybody. I'm Jimmy. This is the Veganic Growers Hour, the 10th one. Wow, we've been here 10 times with everyone. So very, very hello. It's 17 degrees, about 63 Fahrenheit. It's raining again. There's been a lot of rain over the last three weeks, a ton. So much so that here on our little farm, I actually had to close down one of the fields. We had to close down one of the fields uh, completely because it was just too muddy. And it happens to be a clay field. And walking down there or doing anything in there is going to turn it into asphalt. So I planted cover crop, which we're going to talk about tonight. And that's it. That's all we can do. Hello, Emma from Ottawa. Welcome. First show. Good to see you. Um, good to see your name. <laughs> uh, so here the time temperatures are staying quite warm. Uh, they're staying above 10 degrees quite consistently. So we're not actually um, at the warm and settled date, but we're getting close and all the humidity in the air and the forest and the ground and the soil is just keeping everything that much warmer. So even though we're not getting consistency, consistently 13 degrees Celsius or 55 degrees Fahrenheit all the time, it's quite warm and it's warm enough that we really aren't having any pause at all of planting everything. So here at La Ferme de Love, our little, our little farm in Highland, Mary asks, what state are you in? We're in Boileau, Quebec. So we're in Canada. We're in Eastern Canada. We're a little bit, uh, we're an hour and a half uh, west, I'm sorry, east of Ottawa and an hour and a half west of Montreal. Uh, so hello, Anne from St. Lazar and how, hello, Margaret from uh, Watson, Saskatchewan at 20 degrees. Wow, right now you're the balmy one. So Highland Mary, let us know where you are so uh, we can cater the show to you as well. So yes, as I was saying, we're transplanting here every day or seeding every day. We're working beds, getting them prepared. Really soon we're going to be all in. Everything's going to be planted on our little half acre farm. Um, things are going good. Things are going good. So tonight's show, all about zen weeding, planting cover crops, preparing plant-based teas, and a continued discussion on maintenance. And we're going to talk about and go through the entire process for five family groups. So let's get going. So the first topic tonight is what I like to call zen weeding. Uh, so I also want to say hello to Teresa from Nova Scotia. Rainy day here. Yeah, it looks like that's how it is here in Eastern Canada. It's raining. And hello, Catherine from Quebec. Raining on and off. Yes, it's been raining. Um, so yeah, so we're talking about Zen weeding. And let me just make a note on time. So what is Zen way or what is Zen being? Zen is all about focusing on the present moment, fo focusing on the task at hand, and just giving over to the entire process of that task. So really Zen way or Zen being can be applied to anything. It can be applied to weeding, which we're going to talk about, but can also be talk, uh, it can also be um, um, Zen way can be applied to cooking or walking or walking in the forest or doing dishes or cleaning the house, really whatever you want it to be. But really the main point of Zen way is that we are completely focused on what we're doing. We're observing and we're just thinking about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And I like to look at weeding in this way because for me, it is very Zen. When I am on the ground and I always do weeding on my knees, 
kind of crawling through the pathways along the bed. And I do this for a very specific reason. I really want to observe at ground level what's going on with the plants. I want to know what native flora, like I mentioned before, I don't really like to call them weeds. We'll call them native flora or their volunteer plants that we'd like to seed. Um, I like to see what's going on with those native plants. I like to see what's going on with the plants I have growing. I like to see all the insects that are crawling around. I like to see the, the ground beetles. I like to see if there's if there's plants that are being eaten by certain insects that I can identify, um, I really like just being there. When when we start weeding, I like to see the earthworms. I like to see the gr the the gray worms, which we don't want in our fields. But I like to know what's going on. So for me, over two thousand hours of weeding in my farming and and gardening career. And I've come to this philosophy of Zen way, of Zen weeding, that I don't look at it as a chore. I look at it as a task to be accomplished. And I look at it as a way to just give life, breathe life into everything that's around us. I'm going to say hello again to somebody else. Catherine Baker, I love weeding. Very therapeutic. Very well. Jerry Snelling, I'm weeding as I listen to this. Awesome. And Judd from that beer bill. Good to see you. So... My favorite tool, and there are many, and there everybody's going to have their favorite way. Some people are going to like using this tool or this hoe or or this mechanical tool or whatever they like. But I'm going to show you my favorite. I brought props. I don't always bring props, but I brought props. So this is a Japanese hand hoe. And the only place I've been able to find it, and it's very light, by the way. I mean, it's only about a pound at most. Um, and you can see as a very sharp edge here, uh, it fits very well in the palm of the hand. I mean, I have quite big hands, but still it fits very, very well in the hand. And, uh, that's it. It's the Japanese hand hoe. Now, the only place I've been able to find it is at Johnny select seeds. I don't pitch them, but I do order seeds from them. And they're not very expensive. They're about 20 bucks. They used to be about 14, but I think now with the pandemic and the cost of everything, everything is going up. So they're about $20, but these things really last a while. They're hardened steel. And I have seen them um, break apart here at the joint after about three or four seasons. Now we're really, really wet, but uh, again, my favorite tool. Now, when we're talking about Zen, Zen weeding and we're talking about weeding, what I prefer to do, and again, there's many methods and there's many ideas. Uh, some people like to use, say, a hula hoe or another hoe, and they really like to cut the wheat from the top. But what I've noticed here in Quebec is it gets so wet. And if you do that, if you just cut, give it a haircut, basically, and you're not uh, able to get back to it for a couple of weeks, that, that native flora is going to grow back quite strong. And specifically thinking about something like couch grass, um, where, where you have one couch grass that's connected on a long strain of rhizomes. It's a root network where the, the couch grass just keeps coming up and up and up. And if you take your hand hoe, and this is why I like it, take your hand hoe and you find your piece of couch grass and you pull it up, well, then you can pull up the entire root system out. And really, it can be up to three feet long. It is quite incredible. It's quite an incredible plant. But we don't really want it in our garden. So because if we do, then it really will suffocate everything else that's there. So Zen weeding. When you're looking at your gardening plot, all of our, and just to say, all of our beds here are 50 feet long. And that's for a reason. In my years where I have farms uh, for other people, I have weeded rows that were 200, 250, 300 feet long. Sorry about that. My cat just ran off the bed. 300 feet long. And uh, it's like they never end. You can never see the light of the end of the weeding tunnel. I mean, it's awful. So specifically when I created my beds here, I made them 50 feet. I never recommend any beds to be any longer than that. And it's specifically one of the main reasons it's specifically for weeding. So Zen weeding, when you're looking at your bed, best thing to do or your gardening space, best thing to do is take a deep breath, part of the Zen way, deep breath in, out three, four times. Look at the task at hand. Don't look at it as, oh my gosh, I need to get it done. This is awful. This is a terrible job. It's more of you're trying to 
get everything else to breathe. You're breathing. You want to get the plants that you're growing to breathe. And you want even the soil to breathe. And when the soil is too compacted with a lot of different weeds, uh, a lot of different native flora, it's not going to allow you to get the plants growing that you want to have grow. There you go. Zen weeding. So breathe in, breathe out. If you happen to have a partner, it is best to weed in teams. You give each other moral support. I mean, let's face it, sometimes the beds get overcrowded with really, really tough stuff to get out. And it's it can be a little bit daunting. But look at it in a different way. Look at it in a way is that you're trying to breathe, get the soil to breathe, and everything is going to work out just fine. Um, another quick thing on weeding. When I am trying to plant a bed for the first time, I always have it pretty clean. I never really seed a bed or transplant in a bed where there's a bunch of native flora growing. Excuse me. <coughs> For me, I like to have the plants get the best shot of being able to grow without having all that there. Now, other people will not completely agree with me. Some people will say, well, if you know, if you're planting transplanted tomatoes, you can have some, some native flora here and it's fine. Yeah, but again, it really depends on where you live. Here in Quebec, everything gets a, this is a really, really humid year. So if I have a lot of plants growing around my transplant, it is pretty it is pretty sure that they're going to get some sort of mildew or blight really, really quickly in their early growing spurt if there is too much humidity around the plant, which there already is every anyway. So if there's extra native flora there, then it's going to cause. So when I'm starting my garden patch or I'm starting my garden bed, it's always free, as free as possible. And then I seed. And then depending on the culture or transplant, and then depending on the culture, then I will have a more, uh, uh, as many weeding cycles it needs to happen. Normally within our 12 garden, uh, garden fields, which are all 50 feet by 50 feet, um, we will weed everything in two weeks. So we'll pass, we'll do the weeding turn in two weeks, and then in two weeks we'll start again. Not every culture needs to be weeded. And we're going to talk about that, like I said, here in just a little bit. But in the beginning, make sure your beds are clear. Everybody's going to, every, every plant being is going to start off in a better state if they have room to breathe and grow. So there you go. A little bit on Zen weeding. I'm just going to make a note for the replay. Moving on. Uh, planting of cover crops. This is one of my favorite veganic topics. Um, it is something that organic farmers do, but not as, as, as much as us veganic farmers do and not as much as they should. So, however, even when I was an organic farmer and I was an organic farmer in Arizona, having my own farm for about six, uh, six years in the homestead for 12 and then when I traveled around and I worked on organic farms, it was very uncommon that cover crops were used quite extensively. Here, they're an extensive part of our program, and they're, and they're there for many different reasons. So cover crops are very, very effective at covering the soil. They're also extremely effective at mining deeply for nutrients that sometimes our plants, our plants can't get to right away. So they have really deep, extensive root systems, and they'll go down and they'll pick up the minerals, especially micronutrients that are way down deep into the soil. And through their leafy growth, once they're cut down and allowed to compost in bed, then they're going to release those micronutrients and even the macronutrients into the soil so that they can be uptake. Now, based on assimilation, based on heat and water and, uh, or heat and moisture uh, and air, and timing, then they will be available to the plants. But I have never really seen any adverse problems to planting as much cover crops as possible, uh, as long as there is space, even under sowing. We're going to talk all about that. But be very, very careful with which cover crops that you choose, because they can become very invasive. In Arizona, I only cover cropped one year, and that was because the first year we were all excited. We were looking for a, a nitrogen-fixing cover crop, so we decided on 
uh, chickling vetch. And anybody who has vetch growing wild in their gardens will realize that vetch is extremely invasive. Like the couch grass, it has that really, really long root system. So if through the rhizome, there'll be these little vetches coming out. And when you pull out the vetch, it just kind of pops off, but it doesn't come out all the time with this root. So we had chickling vetch everywhere. And because it be can become so matted and there, it was a very sandy soil, becomes so matted and it doesn't want to come out and the root systems are so deep, the plants just didn't thrive as well as they could. So be very, very careful. If you are a tractorless system, and that's what we really talk about a lot on this show, is that we're talking about uh, using hand tools, uh, not using tractors, keeping permanent beds. I would really, really uh, advise against using any kind of perennial cover crop unless you are trying to specifically create a perennial cover crop patch. Uh, like I just mentioned at the beginning of the show, I have one field that this year is completely unplantable. We got so much rain because of the major storm. We got over th almost two and a half inches of rain in 20 minutes. It's saturated to the point where I don't even think it's gonna dry out. And when it does dry out because it's such a clay part of the field, it's gonna basically turn to asphalt. So what I decided to do um, was, or what we decided to do is completely turn it over to cover crops. And I did go ahead and plant a per perennial cover crop. I planted alfalfa. And it's specifically going to be used to be cut to make compost. I'm not gonna, I am gonna cut some and let it um, embed compost so that the alfalfa gets stronger, but it is specifically so I have a lot of green material so that I can make compost, which we add to our garden beds every year. Um, yeah. So be very, very high alfalfa unless you specifically want to create the patch. My favorite, favorite ones, there are three that we use every year and we use them in different ways. And uh, I have always found that they're fantastic. There is oats which we normally plant later in the season because the red winged blackbirds like to eat the seeds. So I actually just got lucky and planted a patch and they didn't eat the seed and germinated before they got to it. Uh, but normally we don't plant that one until July. After we pull our garlic, we usually then with the empty space, go ahead and plant in the oats. Buckwheat is another one of my absolute, absolute favorites. It, it, it creates a vast amount of biomass and the flowers are incredibly prolific. Usually if we plant it now, it starts flowering in mid-July when our uh, all of our cucurbit family are, are flowering profusely. So our winter squashes, our summer squashes, our cucumbers, our melons. And so those bring in all the native bees, uh, both big and small, and they just love, 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 love that buckwheat. And the third one that I really, really like is annual clover. I like bursine clover for, for biomass when you're talking about um, creating a clover patch on an empty plot that uh, let's say you harvested all your radishes and now you have something left over and you wanna go ahead and plant a, a nitrogen fixing leguminous uh, cover crop, we'll go ahead and plant bursine. Or crimson clover, which is a shade tolerant clover, which we use to underseed almost everything that can that can use it so we're going to talk about all that now so let's talk about clover first let's talk about uh the crimson clover so when i'm talking about under sowing i'm talking about under sowing all of our brassica families now after the brassicas so broccoli cabbages cauliflower brussels sprouts rutabaga even some kales uh collard greens when they get about 18 inches high uh, here, we're going to do it probably next week, our first round. We'll go ahead and underseed it, under it with the crimson clover. And anybody who grows black brassicas knows that they're quite heavy feeding. Uh, they pull a lot of nutrients out of the soil. Well, the, clo the clover will work with them. The, they will nitrogen fix, but also will pull up other micronutrients. And the, the root systems and then the fungi, because supposedly mycorrhizal fungi does not associate with brassicas. So it will associate with the leguminous cover crop of clover. So the two are gonna to work together. And as we know about mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae or, or underground mushrooms or fungi, whatever you wanna call, 
however, whatever you want to call it, it moves nutrients as plants need. This is kind of the neural network of the soil that we're talking about. So this is really, really neat. So if you under sow your brassicas with that clover, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help nutri uh, give nutrition to all that brassica family. It's worked really, really well. The only pause, sorry, I have a little itch. The only other, the only pause I would say is that unless your brassicas are high enough, um, the clover can outgrow the black brassicas. So be a little bit careful with your timing. But once they reach about 18 inches and they're going to grow and the clover is going to grow underneath. And then when the brassicas are done, when you've, when you've cut your broccoli or cut your cabbages, then, then the, the crimson clover can go ahead and uh, grow up and grow big. I also, we also like to use the crimson clover to undersee our corn. Corn, they say, is very, they, they claim, is a very, very uh, intensive crop. But we grow sweet corn every year. We love sweet corn. We freeze sweet corn. We eat sweet corn. We sell sweet corn. Um, so in order to sort of combat that whole idea that it depletes the soil, which I'm not entirely sure it does, but let's just say that the scientists are, are, are correct, the agronomes are correct, and it does. Well, the crimson clover is going to work to help nutri give nutrition to that, to that corn and then allow nutrition to stay in the soil because once the corn is done, the stalks die off. Sometimes the stalks or the stalks of the corn are going to die off, say, at the first frost. But the, since the crimson clover is underneath, it might still survive even if it got down to minus two, minus three or 28, 29 degrees. So this is really, really neat. And then again, it creates uh, just a wonderful uh, cover for the winter beds, for the late fall beds. And that's the thing about all cover crops is that what we're trying to handle, we're trying to uh, make sure that the beds are staying covered. Uh, the longer the beds are covered, the better it is for the microorganisms, for all the insects, for all the little uh, small mammals that are living in your gardens. It really wants to be covered as long as possible. It will also help trap soil carbon. It'll keep the carbon in the soil. The plants will help keep the carbon in the soil, which means it won't dissipate out and create more problems for uh, the carbon dioxide, the, the emissions that are in the atmosphere, which we don't need to see rising anymore. That's what cover crops do. So the clover works really, really well at that. When it add frost, it'll die and it'll make a nice mat, a nice canopy. And then if you live in a place where it snows, then the snow will cover it on top. And there's a question, is crim crimson clover invasive like regular clover? No, because crimson clover is an annual. So it will, if you do let it go to flower, which the bees love, so it is kind of nice to let it go flower late in September and let it go to seed, then it will reseed itself, but it doesn't spread, it doesn't get create a mat and spread from the rhizome like white clover. So no, it's not as invasive, um, not even close. It's a really, really good one. I think William Dam, for all of you in Canada, William Dam has it and I buy it from them, organic, and it's it's worked great every year. Moving on to buckwheat. Buckwheat, uh, again, is one of my favorites. It creates massive biomass, lots of flowers. There's a couple other schools of thought about using these, uh, say, these buckwheat and oats. Some people say and claim that it, what you want to do is you want to grow the buckwheat just before it flowers or the oats, just before you see the, the growth there and cut it down and then incorporate it into the soil. Well, again, I'm not talking about a tractor system. So I needed we needed to try to figure out a way to incorporate the green manure, the cover crops into the soil without doing any tilling. Uh, it's not really what we wanted to do. So the system that I came up with, it's kind of a chop and drop system, but then also in addition, lasagna gardening. So let's say what we're trying to do is just build biomass and fertility into a garden spot. So we're going to grow up that buckwheat, grow up that oats, and before it goes to flower or grow, we'll cut it down with a pair of, I have these wonderful pair of walking stand-up scissors that are really cool. And I'll just kind of cut it down into the bed. And if I'm trying, say it's a new plot of, of garden space or a new garden, 
from bed, then I'll do that and then I'll cover it with compost. And then through the compost, it'll grow again. And then when it freezes, everything will die down. So you've created this lasagna system. In the spring, mostly everything is decomposed. And what you have left is a compost with a little bit of, say, dried material, which is great. You can either rake out the dry material, use it as a straw mulch for your cucurbits or your potatoes or your Solanaceae family, or you can just leave it there, move it out of the way, the dry straw mulch, and, and go ahead and transplant. But better, what I've decided to do lately is that, because I really feel it's important as veganic growers that we create as much habitat for insects as possible. And if we do cut it down, all of it down before it goes to growth or before it goes to uh, flower, then we're really um, not giving the insects and the birds something that they can use uh, for, their, for their life cycles. So... I let the buckwheat go to flower and then the buckwheat then even goes to growth. And yeah, in the spring, some of the buckwheat growth will drop onto the ground and create little buckwheat seedlings. Well, you can either let those grow if it's a patch you're not using or just pull them out. So that is the, and I'm going to answer your question, Teresa, in just a minute. Um, so that is how you use buckwheat and oats. And just to go back to that just for a second, so you can let it grow up, cut it, compost on it, let it grow back and not let it go to flower. Or if you wish to invite more bees into your garden, especially later in the year um, or in the middle of the season, as I said with buckwheat, if you plant it right now, um, then go ahead and let it go to flower. Uh, Teresa, to answer your question, no, I don't have a website. However, all of this information will be reposted on Facebook. If we're friends on Facebook, then you're good. Um, but there will be a replay. I will post it on Facebook with the actual dates. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, the timestamps. So you can just go to the video and then you can just that you can go and, and, and drag along to whatever section you want it to for. So like this particular section, planting cover crops, 13 minutes to 27 minutes. I have another question. Uh, Peaches and sugar, can you use buckwheat with broccoli, et cetera, instead of red clover? No, you can't use bro buckwheat with broccoli. Not really. The buckwheat will grow too tall, too fast, and then will shade your broccoli. Um, you don't have to use clover if you don't want. Uh, you can use chipped branch wood if you would rather go ahead and try and mulch. Once your broccoli is established, the roots are very deep. There's not going to be any problem with nitrogen lockup. You can use chipped branch wood. You can even try draw straw, dry strawing your, 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 your broccoli if you want. But clover is going to be a good one. Uh, it's going to be a really good one. It also, again, it has a lot of nitrogen, which because we're eating the flower bud, of all the brassicas for the most part, or the green leaves, we want extra nitrogen for those crops because that those those flower bulbs and those uh, leaves are full of nitrogen. This is what we want to eat. So I would really use clover. I haven't I haven't used buckwheat, and I just wouldn't because, like I said, it would grow too tall too fast. Let's see if there's anything I want to say about that. Yeah, so cut it down, mulch it, compost it, let it grow back, or let it go to flower. It's really up to you. But again, my three favorites are clover, the two different kinds, burst seam and crimson clover, buckwheat, and oats. And the great other thing about oats, if you grow oats, then you can let it go to growth, which is the sort of the oat seed, and you can harvest them. You can either let them go dry and then you can harvest them and you can replant them the next year, or you can harvest them green and they really make a really, really good tea for the end of the night, a really good tisane or an herbal tea uh, mixed with like red, uh, red raspberry leaves. It's really good for uh, women's um, menstrual cycles. It's also really excellent for, for relaxation. So it's a really good it's a really good plant to grow even just to grow it. and to have more grasses in our system like buckwheat like oats even sweet corn because it's a grass in the grass family in one of the families of grasses then we are we are adding to our mix of families of plants that we're talking about so 
that's what I have on cover crops. I hope you enjoyed that little section. I really, really enjoy it. Um, after doing it here as a beginner grower here at La Ferme de Lobe since 2015, so it's been our 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, our eighth season, I would never go back. I would always use it. And, oh yeah, that brings up another point. So I sort of mentioned a little bit that after you say you've pulled your radishes, go ahead and plant a cover crop. I would really do this with every culture that I have. So your first carrots, your first radishes, your first turnips, your first lettuces, anything that you've harvested pretty much all of, go ahead and put a cover crop down with them and let, and if you have let your lettuces go to flower and to seed or some of your radishes go to flower and seed and there's open space, go ahead and companion plant with the cover crop, something else that flowers. You want a really beautiful patch, have your radishes seeding, your lettuces, uh, I'm sorry, your radishes flowering, your lettuces flowering, your coriander flowering, and throw in some buckwheat. And oh my gosh, you have a plethora of all sorts of bees and wasps and hoverflies, and you will never have any pollination problems. Absolutely. Um, and peaches and sugar says, I grow buckwheat and eat the young leaves as a green. Yeah, absolutely. They're really, really nutritious and good for you. So cool. Plant as much buckwheat as you can. All right, so we're moving on to preparing plant-based teas. I posted uh, yesterday or the day before, I think it was yesterday, I posted a very small three-plus minute video on how to make and use a plant-based fermented tea. And it's very, very simple and... Um, how to prepare how to prepare a plant-based fermented tea. Very simple. So there brings up a question that after I posted that, a gentleman, Daniel, asked, isn't a tea something you drink within 24 hours while compost tea is something that is made with aeration? It's a very good question. So yes, normally a tea is something that we say we infuse for few hours uh, a day and then we drink it and that's a tea and it's very sweet it tastes like whatever plant we're trying to use compost tea is a process of taking your own compost putting it into a bucket of water at a certain ratio and adding an aeration pump so it sort of creates a aer aerobic environment and you're creating and you're allowing all the nutrients to get into the water, then you strain it out and you use it as a liquid or a foliar feed. Yeah, so those are two different things. But what I'm talking about is a plant-based fermented tea. And what we are trying to do is we're trying to take a native flora, something like uh, stinging nettles or comfrey. I think you can even use dandelion. Some people use rhubarb leaves. Uh, I like to use clover, yarrow, alfalfa, horsetail, and in whatever ratios you're looking for. And the interesting things about some of those like yarrow and horsetail is they're also antifungal. So if you happen to have plants that are prone to a certain kind of fungus, if you make this plant-based tea uh, and you use those kinds of native flora in your plant-based tea, then you might be giving the plant an extra tonic so that they are, would outcompete that fungus from attacking, uh, attacking their leaves or stems or whatever. My favorites to use, and you can use whichever one you want, my favorites to use are stinging nettles and comfrey. And the reason why I like these two is they grow really fast now when I want them now while the plants are small and just starting to root in. And they also happen to have a nice balance once fermented of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as almost, as well as every single one of the macro, other macro and micronutrients. And there's 17 in total, which includes um, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So there's 17 different mi macro and micronutrients that we're talking about now. Just so we all understand, if a plant is growing green, produces leaves that are that are lush, goes to flower, goes to seed, and does all this with almost no fungal problems, bacterial problems, 
then you are 100% certain that it had every single macro and micronutrient available to it. The reason why I know this is because every single plant in order for it to do that, for it to sprout, to grow, to be lush, to produce flowers and then produce say fruit or seed must have every single one of the 17 macro and micronutrients in order to do that process. So by taking that kind of plant, by taking a come free plant that is doing that, so it's going to flower or a nettle plant that you know is going to go to flower or a yarrow that you know that's going to go to flower you just because you know your plot and going ahead and putting that into a fermented, make the fermentation, which I'm going to tell you how to do that here in just a minute. It will uh, have every single one of those macro and micronutrients. It's very cool. So then it will be available to your plant. Okay, so how do you do it? My favorite method, a one liter jar, a one quart jar, cut whatever you want. Like I said, I use comfrey and nettle, pack it all the way to the top, fill it with water, cap it, put it in a warm spot in the shade and don't do anything for about two weeks. Can even go three, no big deal. What you're gonna see is that the, the leaves and the root and the stems, not the roots, sorry, the leaves and the stems are gonna start like uh, becoming sort of moldy and fermenting and there'll be bubbles and it's just gonna start creating sort of a sludge. And really, that's what you're looking for. That's what you're trying to accomplish. After about two weeks, and really two weeks is fine. If you let it go three, it's not a big deal. After two weeks, you uncap it and be very, very careful with the smell because it's extremely potent. Uh, it will really, really burn your nostrils, the smell. And take that and go ahead and dump it into an old uh, pillowcase or a sheet, whatever you have, into a five-gallon or 20-liter bucket and let it drain out. Go ahead and take out the sheet, kind of squeeze it a little bit. Again, watch out because the smell, the stink will permeate your hands also. It's pretty difficult to wipe off, to, to wash off. But go ahead and do that and then fill the five gallon or 20 liter bucket all the way to the top with, if you have it, rainwater or well water, doesn't matter. And you have a, a very amazing 20 to one mixture of um, liquid feed. It's very simple. It's it's free uh, with the prices of everything just going nutty. The prices of fertilizer going uh, going crazy. We really need to, and veganic growers always uh, already do this every way, but all of us as growers need to really change our philosophy on how we feed our plants. Now, normally we feed every all of our plants by the soil, by the compost. This just gives it an extra boost. Now, there aren't that many scientific studies that have been done on the sort of the value or the, the growth habits of plants that have been compared side by side between plants that have been given, say, a foliar feeding of plant-based fermented tea and those that haven't. So we don't really have much to go on. But what I can say with absolute assurity is in the eight years I've been doing it and I once the season starts, I pretty much make a turn every three to four weeks, um, spraying really everything that could use it. Um, I never spray greens, but anyway, I'll, I'll stick on that just for a minute. I have never seen any adverse effects ever. Like I've never sprayed a plant and all of a sudden it, it started getting yellow or, or, or looked like it was sunburned. Like which can happen if you use liquid foliar feeds of say even seaweed extract. I sprayed seaweed extract on plants and, and, and kind of did a bad thing and sprayed it when it was sunny and really, really warm, say even 28, 29 degrees Fahrenheit or in the mid eighties and it burned the plants, it burned the leaves. But I've never noticed this with using plant-based fermented teas. So take my word for it if you like, do your own experiments if you like, do your own research if you like. I have read that in France at the uh, nurseries there, the pepiniers, they actually sell one gallon, 3.8 liter uh, jugs of nettle extract. So then people can take home and go ahead and dilute it at 10 to 
to one or 20 to one, and then go ahead and feed their plants, either as a liquid feed or a foliar feed. My preference is foliar feeding. I do it at night, pretty much right when the sun goes down, it glistens off the leaves of the plant. I just did it yet last night on my, on my bulbing onions, my green onions, my garlic, which is growing strong, all the potatoes, which is germinated, the first round of brassicas, the first round of cabbages, uh, the kohlrabi, I sprayed it on the artichokes. Um, I also sprayed it in the greenhouse on our greenhouse, to, our greenhouse cherry tomatoes and a few uh, heirloom tomatoes I'm trying in there this year. I also sprayed it on our climbing, our heirloom climbing uh, bush, not bush beans, heirloom climbing, eating beans fresh, fresh eating beans. Uh, just because again, I, I think it's a good tonic. I think it just gives those extra micronutrients through the, through the, through the leaves that, that they really enjoy. So do your own experiments. This is just the process. This is my favorite one. There are many, many, many different, um, different formulas to use. One that people say is that you can go ahead and, and fill an entire five gallon, 20 liter bucket filled to the top with water and then dilute that 10 to one and use that. Well, then you have just a lot. You have 200 liters. I mean, me, I have a pump sprayer that I spray all my plants with this foliar feed. And if I use one liter, yes, last night I used one liter, made 20 liters. It's more than enough. So, and again, we have a half an acre. So you don't need to even make that much. This is a great part about it. You can make a one liter, one quart jar and put it to the side. You don't even really notice it's there. It doesn't take up any space. And again, it's 100% free to make. And we all like free. Why not? It's, it's perfect. So plant-based teas, I am a huge believer in. Try them. I think you're going to enjoy them. So to answer, back to Daniel's question, to answer, is tea something you drink within 24 hours? Yes, it is. Is compost tea made with aeration? Yes, it is. Is a plant-based fermented tea different? Yes, it is, Daniel. Absolutely different. <laughs> oh, I explain that. Look at the video. You'll like it. It's only three minutes. Very simple. I have, I have, uh, in my own way, I show you how to do it. Uh, peaches and peaches and sugar ask, does it keep insects off plants? I don't know. And that's not really why I use it for. Uh, but what I can say, now here's something really interesting. You asked that. I have some parasitic flies and wasps that have been working my potato plant field for the first time. I see them in the greenhouse and I think what they're eating Sometimes in the greenhouses, we can get spider mites or thrips that we don't even really notice because, because since our greenhouse stains open most of the time on the sides, I get a lot of predator, really small predator uh, wasps and flies come in. And I know them, they're kind of a glistening bluish green and they have very thin wings and they're kind of working the tops of the leaves of the, of the pepper plants and they just seem really, really happy. I've been noticing I'm on my potato plants and there probably is some sort of spider mites or something like this on the under, under, le under leaves of the potato plants just because it's been so humid and so cloudy. I'm sure that the insect populations of most of most beings, insect beings are just exploding, but they're there. And they were there last night and I sprayed and pretty much when I walk by, they kind of fly off and go someplace else. And I was like, huh, I wonder... Yeah, I wonder if that's going to be bad. I mean, it's not toxic, so it does smell bad, but I was curious. Anyway, when I went down this morning, they were all there again. So I think that to answer the question, now there are some claims that they do kill aphids, they do kill spider mites. I don't know. I've never really found anything that kills aphids or spider mites, nor would I even try, but that's not really what I use it for. If we're talking about, say, flowering cucurbits, if we spray at night, the bees aren't there anymore. I wouldn't spray on them anyway. But the next morning, it's pretty much all been absorbed, evaporated or absorbed into the leaves. So the next morning, I always see the bees back. So And I never see any dead insects around when I use it. And that's the other thing about when I say adverse, reac adverse reactions to using it. I've never seen uh, adverse, adverse reactions to the plant or adverse reactions to... Uh, our natural 
natural world that we cherish and we're trying to proliferate here on our veganic gardens and farms. So to answer your question, I don't know. It's not really why I use it. I don't think so because the insects always seem like they're back. To answer your question. So let's put this all together. Let's talk about for the last uh, 10 minutes or so, the maintenance of five different families of crops. And these are probably, and these are all crops that you can plant now, pretty much everywhere that you are, um, if you haven't already. And let's say, let's start with Asteraceae. This is the aster family or the daisy family, which includes one of our favorites, lettuces. So if we're talking about maintenance of cultures, and we talked about this on Veganic Growers Hour number nine quite extensively. So if you would like to go back, and again, you can see on Facebook, you can see the the tag of the timestamp and go back and look at the specific section on maintenance. So if we're talking about seeding lettuce, let's say we're talking about seeding lettuce, or let's even say we're talking about transplanting head lettuce. Do we want to weed before we start? Yes. Like I said, you want to have a nice clean bed before you seed or before you transplant. Is thinning necessary? With, with seedling, uh, with uh, transplants, no, because you're already doing the spacing that you believe the lettuce wants. Maybe you want eight inch spacing, or maybe you want 10 inch spacing, maybe you want 12 inch spacing or 30 centimeters, either way. And what about leaf lettuces? Do you need to thin them? What I notice with lettuces is they seem to enjoy the company of each other very much. So they don't mind having extra friends. I've never noticed lettuces to really, it didn't really matter to them if they had buddies. <laughs> so there is absolutely no thinning necessary with lettuce. What about staking or any kind of trellising? No, nope, lettuce doesn't need it. Cover crops are under sowing. This is an interesting one because a lot of our lettuces will let go to, to flower and seed because eventually they just kind of tire out and it just kind of makes sense to do that. So when they do, I'll let the native flora grow under grow underneath them. Sometimes it's clover, sometimes it's plantain, sometimes it's yarrow, sometimes it's daisies, whatever it is, I just let it grow. And then you create a nice companion planting for all the insect species. Does it require foliar, fertil foliar fertilization of plant-based teas? I do never, I never ever spray foliar fertilization of these plant-based teas on any kind of green that I eat. And you probably can. I just don't because of the smell is so bad um, that I really don't want to taste that in my lettuce. Um, on a plant, it's not a big deal because after a few weeks, it's not even, after a couple of days, the smell is going to be gone, but it might permeate into the taste of the leaf. I don't know. I've never really tried it. So if you want to try, experiment, and then let me know how it goes, how it tastes. Let me know. Maybe it'll become a, <laughs> a new delicacy. <laughs> what about watering regime? Very important with all crops. So with lettuces, lettuces are very interesting. They can handle a lot of water and they can handle going very dry. Now, when lettuces go to the end of the stage before you cut, you never want to water before you cut. If you, if you're, say you're cutting, cutting leaf lettuce, you're going to want to cut it and then water it. Uh, the drier lettuces is when you harvest it, the longer it will keep, the more nutrients it'll have. The wetter that it is, it'll have less nutrients and it won't keep as long. There you go. That's it about lettuce. Let's continue on. Uh, allium family. In this particular case, let's talk about green onions. Do you need to weed? Yes. Again, everything wants weeding. Thinning necessary. I You can go ahead and hand seed your green onions, but green onions can grow really, really close together. They can grow within, what's that? Maybe a half an inch, quarter inch, uh, one centimeter apart. I even, when we, we transplant our green onions and we will transplant them in bunches of three or four. So green onions don't mind. So thinning is absolutely not necessary. Staking, no, they're very strong. Once their, their stem is there and, and fort, uh, we call it a tige also, but when the, once the stem is there, they grow, they don't, they don't need any support at all. Cover crops, under sowing. Pretty much all allium families really don't like to have competition because of their kind of shallowish root systems. Um, pretty much anything, 
any kind of native flora is going to go ahead and steal nutrients away. The general rule, though, is, is once you see the plant start growing and it's vibrant and it's kind of gotten over its root shock, and you can tell because sometimes when you transplant something, it'll just sit there. But then when it grows, you'll see it gets green and starts getting bigger. It can handle more weed and native flora pressures, uh, volunteer plant pressures. It really, if you can't get around to it, don't worry about it. Don't freak out. It, it, it's not going to matter. It's better to keep them as clean as possible, the allium family. But if you if you can't or you don't, well, you just have to go through the native flora to find your onions. That's all. But they will outcompete once they get bigger. Foliar fertilization, absolutely. I would foliar feed green onions. Uh, I would do it here. I do it. I, I would do all onions. Green onions, I would only do once, and then once they start getting big, then again, you don't really want to have that 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 taste in the green onion if it if it has a taste. I, I've never tasted it anywhere, so I don't know. But again, I don't spray anything that I eat the leaves of, so I don't know. Uh, but yes, I would go ahead and foliar feed it, uh, fertilize it with the plant-based fermented tea once. And then after that, I would let it go. Bulbing onions, I would do it a couple of times during the season. I would do it in, I just did it in June. I would do it again in July. And then in August, we would start harvesting. So it would be okay. Watering regime. Yeah, onions are the same. They want a lot of water to establish their roots. And then as they get bigger, they want a lot less. They can go quite dry. Onions are really amazing. They can go weeks without water once they um once they get really established so really depends on where you live continuing on physalis which would be our bush beans weeding absolutely thinning uh bush beans are pretty easy to seed so it, when you're seeding them you just seed them about uh five centimeters apart two inches and they're fine. Put them in three rows if you like. If you live in a very sunny, uh, dry place, where like I lived in Arizona, you can put five rows of beans very close together. So you can put them about 15 centimeters apart and they'll grow just fine. Here in Quebec, what I find is that by planting them too close together in, 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 in rows, uh, too close, they end up molding quite quickly, unfortunately. So I've settled on three. So if I have a 30 inch bed, I'll have three rows of beans. So one on one side, one on the other, one in the middle. There you go, about five centimeters apart, and then they should grow nice and healthy for you. Staking, usually not necessary, but sometimes you can come across what's called a half runner bush bean. And a half runner is going to put out a little tendril like it wants to climb, but it's only going to get up, oh, maybe a little over two feet or 50 centimeters. You might want to think about if you have these kinds of beans, thinking about putting a small, pounding a small stake in the ground and, and putting some, just some twine, like some sisal or hemp twine around so that they have that kind of keeps them enclosed and gives them something to grip onto so it gives them some support but if they're just regular bush beans without that tendril then no they don't need any staking cover crops are under sowing no they're already fixing nitrogen into the soil uh they kind of do their own work and because of their habit at the end of the season when it freezes they create a nice canopy of um green matter that then becomes nice brown mulch before the snow. So it's very neat. Foliar fertilizations. I never foliar feed the, the beans. Beans tend to pretty much grow very well. I also never put compost down before I plant beans. If you have a, even a semi-fertile soil, they're pretty resilient. They'll just grow. They don't really mind. You give them a lot of water when they're germinating. And after that, they're also very drought tolerant. General rule for most plants is that most plants once established can be very, very drought tolerant, even more than you believe them to be. Plus again, the less water they get at the time of harvest, the more nutritious they're going to be. And this is a proven study. Continuing on, I have two more and I think I have time. Very cool. Umbelliferae family, This in this particular family, we're talking about carrots. 
Carrots are a very difficult one because they need to be weeded a lot. They take about two weeks, depending on where you live, sometimes even three weeks to germinate. And they're very slow to start. So you have just this little dicotyledon that comes and it kind of sits there for about four or five days and doesn't do too much. But all the while, the native flora is pushing around. And, and because the seedling of the, of the carrot is... If you pull out native flora next to the carrot seedling, it's going to come out. And carrot seeds are so small that when you seed them, in the end, you really want them to be about two and a half, three centimeters, one inch or so apart so that they can grow to the size that you want. But when you're seeding them, it's pretty common that you're going to end up having like five or six bunched together. Well, you can't have that. You got to have to thin them. So going back to weeding, carrots need to be weeded before you plant then when they germinate up then you can pull out the larger weeds but wait until you can see until you start seeing the nice fronds of the carrots and then you can go ahead and use your japanese hand hoe and go in between your your rows and when we're using this japanese hand hoe we just kind of delicately take it far away from us and kind of delicately work the soil towards us and it kind of aerates the soil and then takes out the weeds that are in between rows. So if we're talking the rows of bush beans or the rows of carrots. Thinning necessary? Absolutely. The thinning of carrots is necessary. Again, you want to have carrots at about one inch or two and a half to three centimeters apart. Otherwise, they will stay very, very small. Further than that, and they're going to get quite big quite fast. A big carrot is a mealy carrot. Uh, the size that you're looking for is about like that. So that's maximum. Um, staking carrots, not necessary. Cover crops, no, I wouldn't cover crop. And depending on how you're harvesting your carrots, some people will harvest all the carrots and then take the greens and make, say, like a carrot top pesto. Or us at the farm will go ahead and bunch carrots and sell them that way. If they're storage carrots, then we'll pop the greens off and we'll leave them in the bed. If for whatever reason the bed is um, kind of open after you pull all your carrots out, we'll then go ahead and cover crop depending on the timing. Buckwheat works great after, after your carrots. Foliar fertilization, I never foliar feed the carrots. Doesn't seem necessary. Once they grow, they grow. And watering regime, same. You want to make sure they're well watered when they're small. Uh, when the seedlings, and then after that, they can go quite dry. Um, but only when they start creating carrots do you want them to start drying out. Otherwise, the taste will be dry. Um, too wet, and they're going to get mealy or mushy, and you're going to cause problems in your soil. Very last one, Solanaceae, which in this particular case, we're talking about tomatoes, weeding, yeah, but then once the tomatoes grow up, you can be a little bit lack, lackadaisical about it. You can let the native flora kind of be in with the tomatoes as long as you don't live in a place where it's too humid like here. Uh, thinning, not necessary because you're already transplanting in the tomatoes. Staking, absolutely. Depending on the size of your tomato plants, my preference is a one inch by two inch wooden stake. Pound it into the ground for a determinant tomato plant. It'll be six feet tall. And we tie it very uh, gently to the stem and the stake with old pieces of cotton clothing that basically we've worn out from farming. So we'll just kind of rip it up into strips or cut it into strips and tie that delicately. So we're recycling all materials. Everything goes back in the soil. And if it's cotton, it eventually decomposes. The, the reason I like wooden stakes is even if they do start deteriorating, which they will, then you have a smaller stake for smaller tomato plants. Um, but that wood can also then be burned and used as wood ash that we then put back in the field. So everything, like everything that we do here at La Ferme de Love and what you should all be thinking about in your own gardens is everything is circular. Um... Cover crops, under sowing, I wouldn't. Uh, here, you can if you live in a drier environment with like the uh, annual crimson clover. That could work very, very well for you. Uh, I've also done dry straw mulching and that I, I really, really like because it keeps the, the, the splatter, the water splatter uh, from 
grabbing uh, the soil microbes that create funguses that that really like to attach to tomatoes, especially early in the season, like July. Foliar fertilization, I will all the time, even when the tomatoes are green. When the tomatoes start blushing, I do not foliar feed because, again, I don't want to taste if there's any taste in my tomatoes. And watering regime, water well when you transplant. Probably don't need to water for about a week or longer. And uh, they can also go very dry. A great tip, and I might run over about two minutes, sorry, but stick with me. Uh, a great tip for tomatoes is once they're blushing, try to discontinue water. The drier they are when you harvest the tomato, the tastier they're going to be. So there you go. That's the show for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, a couple of events coming up in maybe your neck of the woods. On the 18th of June, uh, Veg Ottawa, the group, is having a, their first summer potluck. I believe it's their first one, so very cool. You can check out their event online on Facebook and join up with them. I think that's very neat. And if you happen to be in the Vermont area, June 26th is the Pride Month Vegan Picnic at Vine Sanctuary, which is just a really beautiful vegan sanctuary, farm sanctuary in Springfield, Vermont. I've never been, but the, the pictures look amazing. Uh, that's Patrice Jones and gang. And if you happen to uh, be in Vermont, go check that out because that seems neat too. For us here at the Veganic Growers Hour, the next show is in two weeks on the 23rd of June. And we're gonna talk about all about insect presences and whatever insect pressures you might have. So ask me your questions on Facebook, on YouTube. If you have any insects that give you trouble or if you have any insects that you don't see but you wish you would and what plants to attract them, please write me. This is gonna be a really cool show. I am very passionate about all flying little insect beings, all crawling little insect beings. Um, also self-pollination of squashes and bringing out the dehydrator. So that's it. So as always, thank you uh, for being with us here on this Thursday night. I know you have many choices and many options to think about in your nighttime regime. And I, I, I am just blessed that you decided to spend that time with me. So have a very good night. And until I see you again, peace.